Cool. So thank you so much for the, the introduction and for the invitation to come up here to talk. Um, so, so again, uh, I come from the Center for Open Science, which is a nonprofit uh, tech startup down in Charlottesville, so a few hours away. Um, we've been around for a couple of years now, uh, and we, we, uh, we're a nonprofit, but we kind of approach what we're doing uh, more like a for-profit tech startup, which is why we describe ourselves that way. Uh, we, we are composed mostly of scientists and uh, software developers, uh, and then a couple or a person from libraries uh, so far. Um, but what we're, what we're working on is, is a lot of different things uh, across the entire scientific space um, around open source software, around uh, different strategies, uh, trying to address incentives and barriers issues, a wide variety of different things. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is a couple of uh, five different things that we are doing in those different environments uh, to try and increase access and openness around research. Uh, we're mostly around scientific research, but this could be thought about more broadly if, if that's of interest to you. Um, many of the things that we do, I think, could apply outside of science as well onto broader scholarship generally. Um, so, so keep that in mind as a, a possibility here. Um, so. Just kind of to start off, so why is this an important thing and why do we do what we do? Um, there are, are lots of, there have been a lot of negative uh, conversations in the past number of years uh, out there in press, out there in different uh, domain areas. Um, lots of different problems and discussions around why science cannot be reproduced, uh, why there are issues of transparency. Um, a whole lot of different angles and, and aspects of this. Uh, you know, things noted up here, things like power failure, so uh, insufficient uh, sample sizes, um, inability to, to reproduce um, findings based on a, a lot of these different factors. This is one part of it. Uh, we also think a lot about pure issues of efficiency and uh, effectiveness in doing research. Um, so what are the, the problems that are involved in actually being able to share research from one person to another or across a team or as research is, is published and shared, um, can somebody else actually find it and understand what it is in the first place and understand what to do with it? So if the question of um, reproducibility comes up or if somebody wants to do a replication of, of a, a study, um, could they actually go through the process of doing it? Is there sufficient information there? Um, so there, there are a whole lot of different aspects to this. Uh, these are kind of the, the negative parts that get most of the attention. Uh, we also try and stress the other aspects of pure accumulation of knowledge, um, increasing access to research results, transparency, um, and making uh, all of this research more equitable. Uh, so allowing people in the world who don't presently have some sort of interaction and access with research, uh, giving them the, the opportunity to participate in, in science. Um, so those are kind of like very high level ideals that we, that we think a lot about. Um, and I think that you'll see in some of the strategies that I talk about. So uh, going beyond that, um, another way of thinking about this, and I, I alluded to this at the beginning, uh, incentives and barriers. Uh, we think about this and what sort of things are in the way of, of people being more transparent and open with their research. Uh, one aspect of this is, is norms and perceived norms. So on the left side here, we have a column of norms. Um, things like communality, so being open and sharing uh, and making everybody sort of uh, able to be involved in the, in the research. Uh, universalism, um, the value of, of being able to evaluate research on its own merit. Uh, so not based on who it was that did it, but what it was that was done. Uh, disinterestedness, so thinking about this from the point of uh, purely asking a question and wanting to get whatever result is going to come, not necessarily trying to find a specific result and being biased towards that. Uh, organized skepticism, this is thinking about all the evidence, even if it is counter to the thing that you have found before or the thing that you want to find. Obviously, wanting to find is not a good way of thinking about that in the first place. Uh, another point on here is, is quality. Um, so this, this list overall, the norms and counter norms, uh, was established in 1942 by Robert Merton. Um, the quality and quantity uh, uh, oppositions here are outside of that list but are still relevant for this discussion. So 
the point being, uh, norms on the left, counter norms, um, which of these things are the ones that people generally think about and subscribe to, right? So maybe somebody, some people in the, the room have seen this uh, point before, uh, but I think it'll be illustrated on the next slide here. So a study was done in 2007 of uh, 3,247 mid and early career NIH researchers. And it was looking at these norms and counter norms and asking people uh, what they subscribe to, what they do, and what others do. And it shows the distribution of this. So at the top here, we have mid-career and early career subscriptions. So the left gray bar is uh, what do you subscribe to? What are the ideals that you believe in? And people mostly are on the norms, right? They believe in all of those norms. There's a very small portion on the counter norms. The second part here is the own behavior. So what do you do in practice? And you see that this shifts a little bit to the left. Uh, so people say, I believe in this thing, but in practice, I don't really do exactly that for a whole variety of reasons. But, but there's a little bit of a shift. And the third part here is, what does everybody else do? And you see it almost entirely shifts the opposite way. So I believe in the, the norms. I practice mostly the norms. And then everybody else does the counter norms. Right? So that's a bit of a problem here. And this is the type of perception issue that we're trying to get at. Uh, and we think a lot about and we incorporate into all the strategies that we have. Um, so we're, we're constantly trying to think of if people want to do the, the norm, the right thing, uh, but they practice something a little bit different and they think everybody else does something different, what are the strategies that we can employ to help people make a little bit of a shift there? And, and we think about small strategies often. What are the smallest steps that people can take to try and help make a shift in that. Um, so uh, that's a component of it. Uh, so a little bit more of, of what we do and what we are. Uh, we were started in 2013. We're a nonprofit tech startup. We are uh, funded by grants. Uh, we have four leading foundation funders, about 14, 15 million in initial funding at this point. Uh, we're growing very quickly. So my numbers are actually always outdated on this, um, but we've got somewhere between 25 and 30 full-time people right now, depending on uh, the day that we talk about this. Uh, and we always have a very strong intern team. We see uh, an internship program as a, a critical part of this for inclusivity, for allowing more people to be involved and contribute and uh, participate in, in this process of openness and science. Uh, so we have a very strong intern program. Uh, and our team, again, is, is mostly software developers and researchers. And we, we structure it that way because we're mostly a tech shop. We build a lot of software. We build a lot of products that people can use uh, to get at these issues of incentives and barriers. Um, but we do it from the perspective of scientists. So many of the people on the team are scientists, have deep backgrounds in science, um, are developers who were in science areas you know, in their educational period. Uh, so that's sort of the context for, for thinking about all of this. So our, our overall style and strategy that complements this, uh, we, we operate like a tech startup. We, we operate uh, and act very quickly. So we sort of make quick plans. We take action on those things now. And then we iterate a lot. Uh, so we, we tend not to spend months, years planning. We spend days, weeks planning. We operate on uh, three-month epic cycles where we strategize on what we're going to do, we execute in those three months, and then we decide if we're going to do something different after that. Uh, and this has proven pretty well for us so far in terms of acting quick. So all of the five things that I'm going to talk about uh, come with that sort of flavor of, of uh, strategy involved. Our team is, is organized into these three main subteams: community, meta science infrastructure. Uh, community is mostly outreach and sort of activity with the community. Meta science is the, the team that studies the whole process of what we do. Uh, and infrastructure, where most of our team is, is the group that builds the tools that we, we provide as solutions. Um, so the five points I talk about will be within those areas. Uh, so the first one, uh, badges. So we talked about this norm counter norm issue. Um, and so one thing that we, we've put out there as a possibility is these, these badges. Uh, so the way that this works is these are badges to acknowledge open practices. So if people presently are not sharing their data, not sharing their materials, uh, not sharing other aspects of, of their research, 
one approach to that is make a mandate and say you have to do these things. And you might get, you might get people to do it. Uh, it might require a lot of uh, groaning and, and uh, opposition. Um, and the quality might be kind of low. Right? So what we've approached instead is, is providing uh, an opt-in approach. So what happens here is a researcher says, I'm going to share my data voluntarily. Uh, a journal like Psychological Science um, says, we will give you a badge if you share your data. Uh, that researcher says, OK, I want a badge. I'm going to get a badge on my paper. I share my data. Um, the journal publishes that paper with the badge on it. And then if you have an issue that has 10 articles in it, and one has a badge and the others don't, there's peer pressure in that situation. Right? People feel like they want to get a badge, so they're going to do the extra work in order to get that badge. Um, it's been a pretty productive process so far. Uh, psychological science uh, was the first adopter of this, and at this point is edging up to, I think, about 50% or so that are, are issuing badges, uh, which is, is a good sign. There are a number of other journals, mostly in psychology so far, but uh, this is starting to spread out. Um, and it's, it's a very low risk, uh, low cost way of, of testing this out and getting people to share their data. Uh, one thing that we'll be doing in the, the relatively near future, hopefully, is, is studying whether this has obviously some impact in terms of better research access and quality, aside from simply creating some competition in this. Um, so another way of looking at this, uh, if, if you're interested in how this actually shows up, um, in the article at the end, uh, this is where the badges would be shown. So in this particular case, uh, an article was issued all three badges. And it shows um, that all materials, data, and the pre-registered design are available at that URL. Uh, and those are the badges that were awarded. So a specific criteria was met in order to get each of those badges. Um, and that is issued by the journal. So, so we simply propose the concept of this and then work with journals on the uh, adoption and implementation part. So that's one example from the community end of, uh, of a, strategy, a strategy to try and increase openness and, and access to the research. So another one, um, also in the publishing space and also community driven, uh, is register reports. Has anybody heard of this before? So, uh, so the idea here um, is this, this is a concept of the scientific method. Um, so there are a whole variety of issues that happen along the way here. Lack of replication, uh, low statistical power, p-hacking, um, harking, publication bias, lack of data sharing. So all of these are things that sort of happen along different points in the cycle. Uh, so what we're trying to do with, with a, a team of researchers in different disciplines is, is think about how can we tackle these things in the publication process. So if you look at this, uh, this is a typical publishing cycle. Design, collect, analyze, uh, report. You get peer review at that point, and then you publish. So what happens here is um, there's a strong bias towards positive results. This is the issue that happens. Um, journals end up selecting uh, peer review and journals end up selecting mostly the positive results, the negative results get left out. People are sort of pushed towards trying to get more of those positive results instead of providing the results that are the results. Um, and it leads to all of those problems that, that we were talking about before. So the way in which this can change is shifting the peer review process to earlier on. Um, so at the design state, uh, a design is completed and a proposal is made to, to a journal and a peer review committee, um, effectively saying, this is the question that we're going to ask. This is the way that we're going to approach this question. Um, and the journal reviews that as the, the point of merit. And if they approve it, then it's a matter of following through on that, and it will get published. That way, the, the thing that's being published, it doesn't matter whether it's negative or positive, it will get published. And it will address some of those uh, problems and motivations that, that uh, leak into this. So looking at it a different way, um, up here at the beginning, we have introduction method proposed, the editorial triage, the rejection. Um, we go through all of this in the initial revision. The in principle acceptance happens up here at the, this point. Authors conduct the study. They do all of the stage two work. 
and then it gets stage two peer review, which basically is a checkpoint against the original and the final manuscript. So this has the potential to heavily shift um, this bias issue and, and hopefully eliminate it potentially or at least reduce it heavily. Um, so we have a, a number of, of groups that have bought in to, to try this out. Um, in most cases, it's coming in the form of uh, special issues uh, because that's the easiest way to test something out without having to overhaul the entire uh, peer review and publishing process. Um, but you see that there, there's a distribution across a variety of areas, mostly still in psychology, um, some neuroscience. Um, this one is a very big deal. So eLife is a, a publisher uh, that is, is, it's a new open access publisher sponsored by uh, Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Wellcome Trust, and Max Planck. Um, and they're our partner for a project that I'm going to talk about next in, in reproducibility. Um, and the model there is publishing all the results of this project, uh, 50 replications um, in eLife under the registered reports model. So that's a very exciting thing. Um, and that's a commitment over a several year period of this model. So we'll really figure out whether this does have the effect that we think it could. Um, yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's an interesting and kind of exciting way of uh, flipping the model around and seeing whether we can get away from some of these biases that are in the, the system. So the third uh, highlight project here is this reproducibility project cancer biology. So our, our meta science team studies, uh, basically studies how the research process works and where it doesn't work and tries to think about ways um, to do this very systematically and then to, to influence these other activities that we're involved in. So the incentives, barriers, infrastructure building, all of these different things. Whatever ways we can do to sort of help increase integrity and transparency. Um, so the reproducibility project here, this is the, the quick summary of it. Um, this is a model for studying reproducibility uh, that ideally we can replicate into different fields and we're, we're looking at that now. Um, but the strategy here is we, we selected 50 high impact cancer biology studies between 2010 and 2012. So these were published in Nature, Science, Cell, the top journals in this field. Um, there was a very transparent selection criterion process. So everybody knows how the studies that were selected got into this, what the criteria was. Um, and the types of questions that we're trying to ask for this are, are these things down here. So what's the overall rate of reproducibility? in a sample of a published literature. Uh, and this is a question you could ask in any field. Um, obstacles, feasibility, predictors for achieving reproducibility. So what are the factors that make something reproducible or not? Um, these are questions that people have lots of guesses on, but hasn't really been looked at in a systematic way quite like this. Um, so we're trying to really tackle this. So the, the idea here is we have um, these 50 studies that were selected. We work with this group here, Science Exchange, which is a marketplace uh, for, for labs that do, uh, that do different types of uh, biomedical research. Um, and we identify the experiment that needs to be done. Science Exchange finds the lab that can do the work uh, and gets the results from this third party so that we can replicate 50 of these studies and, and be able to analyze them in this way. Uh, so this is a, a pretty big deal, pretty high profile thing. Um, and the outcome of this is, is really what's most important. Uh, so there's a lot of concern around reproducibility and replications about pinpointing particular studies and sort of the personal attack issue that comes with that. Uh, but that's not really an important aspect of this. That's not the goal in any way. Um, the goal entirely is understanding these types of questions down below and being able to understand how to apply that to other fields as well uh, with the overall goal of learning how to help people become more open and transparent and increase the integrity with their <coughs> research. Uh, so big complicated project, but hopefully uh, leading to a, a very useful and important outcome for, for understanding this research process. All right, so, uh, so that's three, three points uh, highlighting there. So the fourth one, um, this is kind of the, this one is going to be the bulk of the talk. Um, and this is our main infrastructure platform. So, so I said that most of our team is, is software developers. 
Uh, this is what the majority of the team works on. Uh, it's a, a platform that you can um, go and check out today if you're interested. Um, it is a completely free, completely open source uh, hosted software package. So you can go to osf.io uh, and go and use this. And the, it does many different things, but sort of the summary point here is it's kind of a project management, um, data sharing, material sharing, uh, collaboration, um, preservation platform. All of these things in a box. Um, and it's free and it's open source. And I stress that because we see that as an additional thing that's really necessary in order to help support open access. Uh, without that, people are having to make the choice. Do I do this thing that costs me money when I don't have money? Or do I make a compromise and spend money on this but not on something else? Uh, we're trying to clear that out of the equation here. Um, so free is really important. Open source is really important for being transparent. Uh, people can entirely evaluate this themselves and determine, is this the system that's going to work for me? Um, there aren't secrets in it. It's open. Um, so, so that's what we have as a platform. Uh, so I'll kind of walk through some of the features of it. And these are things that, that hopefully kind of illustrate uh, some of the, the technical barriers or process barriers that people might encounter um, and ways that we try and address it. So once you create an account, you'll be on the dashboard here. Uh, on the left side, we have this project organizer, which is, uh, it, it kind of looks like a file manager um, that you would see on your desktop or in many different applications. It's a place for you to go and put things. Uh, we allow you to put any sort of things in there. So uh, documents, uh, data files, materials, protocols, um, anything. Uh, we don't provide any sort of constraints or require anything on that. On the right side is, is a quick uh, onboarding process. So you can create a project, you can register a project, you can upload a file. Um, all of this has very sort of easy interactivity, um, all with the objective of being able to help people get in and do this now. Uh, we try and make this as low of a barrier as possible uh, and adhere as much as possible to people's current workflow rather than trying to make them completely change their workflow and, and come over to where we are. Um, so we try and align it that way. So this is what a project actually looks like. Uh, hopefully people can see it from back there. Um, so the project overview page, you have an overview menu bar, uh, a couple of different highlight points here. There's a sharing section. So this is where you get to decide who has access to this uh, or who you want to have access. The second box down is private or public. So despite the fact that obviously Center for Open Science is interested in open, uh, an open science framework is interested in open, uh, we recognize that many people aren't ready for that. So we're not going to require that. So the default on any project that's created is private. So you go in, you create a project, by default, private, you put whatever you want there, nobody else is going to see it. Um, but we make it really, really easy if you do want to make it public. Click a button, and it becomes public. Um, and that would be that button right there. Uh, down below, uh, second thing to highlight here is citation. Uh, one thing that we think is, is extremely important in use of this and uh, dissemination of this knowledge is being able to cite it properly. So we make citation a, a central component of this. Um, citations are actually uh, automatically generated. You can choose the citation format that you want and it will create a citation around that project uh, based on all of the metadata elements that are part of it. Um, in a very extensive list of different citation formats. I think there are probably 150 options right now. Um, yeah, so that's something fun to explore if, if you're interested. Uh, the thing that I'm highlighting down here at the bottom is this recent activity. So one thing that, that a lot of our users don't necessarily know about or uh, think about in their day-to-day -day workflow now, but we offer automatically to everybody, um, is an activity log and automatic versioning. So. Uh, this is critically important for understanding how a project evolves. Right, so if, if I'm doing research right now and I've got it on my desktop and I'm sharing some files with somebody else and, and somebody else asks what we did, it's going to be really, really hard to recreate that whole story. Right, it's going to take a lot of time. It's going to take a lot of attention. Um, if you put it all in here, it does all of that for you. You drop a file in here, it logs that. If you change that file, it logs it. If you add somebody to your project, it logs that. If you uh, add a component, which is like a subfolder to your project, it logs it. 
all of these different types of actions are tracked and, and versioned. So it makes it very, very easy for the entire provenance, the trail of, of the research, um, to be visible and transparent right from the start. And this applies also whether it's private or public. So if you're managing a project privately right now, it's tracking everything. And when you make it public, somebody else can figure that out and see the entire evolution. So, um, so we think that's, that's a highly attractive feature, but something that people might still need to get used to a little bit. Uh, so, so moving on. Um, so wiki is a, another feature um, that's built in. Um, so every project has wiki as an option. Um, and this is wiki like every other wiki that you probably have ever used, uh, except it's a collaborative wiki. So it's Google, style, Google Docs style. So if, if you've used Google Docs where you can go in and you can type and I can type at the same time and it can see that both of these things are happening and we can resolve the conflicts if there are conflicts, uh, it does this. It does exactly that. Um, so that's kind of a nice feature. We also have wiki history. Um, you can add new or edit new pages. So there's a, a pretty strong uh, structure in there. There also are some other fun features in there too. Uh, you can embed different types of files within the wiki and actually render them. Um, so if you have a video file, you can tag YouTube a certain way and actually show a YouTube video within there, um, different types of data files, things like that. And that'll be expanding uh, as we go too. Uh, adding components. So components, again, are, are things like sub subfolders. Uh, one thing that, that we've made a very conscious decision on here is not to impose too much structure on people. Uh, we recognize that everybody organizes their things differently. And if we're going to uh, accommodate workflows as they are right now and try and provide better ways, uh, we don't want to dictate how somebody should organize a project from the start. Um, so we provide these components and we let people structure the components as they like. Uh, you can have as many components, you can nest them as many ways as you like. Um, you can call them whatever you want. You can create templates on them and sort of repeat certain practices. Lots of different things like that. Uh, so add a component, name the component. You can choose a, a category or template if you like. Um, and then the component ends up showing up. And the thing here is this is the top level name of the project and that's the component. So it looks like a, it's a child of the parent effectively there. Um, so this, this allows people to organize projects in whichever way makes most sense for them. Um, so an example here would be you could have a project that uh, one, one model might be having a, a top level project like uh, study one and then having different components for things like the pre-analysis plan, the protocol, the data collection, article one, article two, article three, whichever, all of those different parts or it could be structured by a lab. It could be a whole lot of different uh, ways of organizing it. And we provide that as an option for people. Uh, contributors is another thing. So uh, one thing we recognize here is that there are lots of different ways that people want to collaborate and interact with this. Um, so we provide different ways of uh, controlling that type of access beyond public and private. Um, so the, the level of controls that we have right now are read, read, write, and administrator. Um, those are the primary levels of control. So it's, it's rather easy. You go to the sharing section on a project, you add contributors, you, s you search somebody's name, you select from results, you give them uh, the permissions that you like, and then you move on. Um, and this obviously can all be changed later as, as needed. Um, so this is very helpful given that research teams often have different types of people participating in them. Um, so a, a PI might have one, one level of access. Grad students might have a different, undergraduates on the team might have a totally different level. Um, and this is all controlled uh, by the users. Uh, privacy. This is critically important, especially in this audience, I imagine. Um, so again, what, what I said earlier about the uh, default to being private and making it public as an option, we have a warning that comes up here that is a very uh, direct, clear statement saying that if something is made public, you can always take that back, but people might have seen it in the interim. Right? So we don't want anybody to be surprised by that type of activity. Uh, so we try and be as transparent as we can in the actions and the impl implications of the actions as, as you go. 
Uh, so back at the beginning here, um, the, the uploading of files. Uh, this is a really simple interaction. Um, there are two ways to do it. You can click a button up here, and it will uh, pull up a file addition window, or you can just drag and drop. Uh, we try and provide a, a variety of different ways of interacting there. I mentioned versioning as a, another thing that, that's available here. Uh, so this is an example file. So I have badges disclosure template. This is the, the process of criteria for badges. Um, over here, it's showing different versions. So every time that file gets uploaded in the same way that you might see version or track history in, uh, in Google Docs or in, in Word or anything like that, um, this is doing it on every single type of file that gets added. So there's no exclusivity. Um, you know, if you have a, an obscure file type, it's going to track a version exactly the same way. Um, and it shows the version number, the date, the user, the number of downloads of that version. Um, so somebody can always go back and figure out what happened along the way there. Uh, so, so this is a, a different, this feature is a concept that many people are not at all familiar with. Um, who in here has heard of registrations as a, a thing? No. So this is related to what I talked about earlier with registered reports um, as, as one way of thinking about it. Uh, and the idea here is uh, to avoid bias in, in your research and sort of shifting toward shifting behavior or practice towards a certain outcome that you would hope to see, perhaps. Um, one way of getting around that is creating checkpoints along the way and saying, uh, at the very beginning, here's my hypothesis and here's my data collection plan. Um, and then creating a registration, a frozen time, uh, uh, frozen registered version of this um, that, that everybody else can look at and say, at this point in time, this was exactly the plan, and there's no debate, there's no changing that. Um, and then when you get to it later on, you can reference that and provide confirmation for somebody else or for yourself to say, yeah, that is what I said I was going to do, and I haven't changed my mind based on the results that I'm seeing that aren't the results I thought I was going to see. Um, so this is a, a useful way of getting around that. That's, we apply it in a, a more general way. People can use it for lots of different things, but that's really one of the main intentions of it is to try and shift that bias issue. So this is very simple. You're on a project. Uh, you click a new registration. You select a template. We have a variety of options here because there are an increasing uh, number of definitions of registrations. So different uh, disciplines can say a registration in our field is these are, are these different things. We want to be sure that we capture these different elements um, in a registration. Uh, so we would specify those here. And then it creates this thing over here. And it looks exactly like the project does, except up at the top it says this project, uh, or the project is a registration of the project, uh, which is referencing that one, um, has been frozen and cannot be edited. So that is something that can then be used um, perhaps to send to a journal, to a reviewer, it could be sent to a, a grant uh, reviewer. Uh, lots of different groups can, can look at this at a later point as, as validation that the thing that you said you were going to do uh, is the thing that you did. And there's no sort of tweaking or adjustment of that. Um, so this is, it's an interesting thing to, to sort of observe and, and see how this evolves. Uh, so sharing work. Um, this is one of the other things. So this is going beyond the point of contributors and that type of permissions. Um, many of these different types of reviewer groups, journals or grants or, or any other uh, types of peer review process are increasingly interested in looking at the data and the materials along the way. Um, so one thing that we provide here is, is view only links, uh, which is also analogous to something like Google Docs, what that offers, like uh, security through obscurity, right? Um, creating a link that you can only see if, if it's shared with you. Um, so we provide that as an option here uh, for a project or for parts of projects. And we provide two flavors of it. There's the general uh, view only link, and then there's also the anonymized, uh, which is an option. Uh, so the anonymized will go in and wipe all the names off of the metadata aspects of a project. So the activity log, the versions, uh, the contributor list, all of those different places um, will be fully anonymized. So this is extremely helpful for 
uh, for meeting different expectations of publishers, of uh, grant reviewers, different types of groups that are implementing this as a strategy. Um, another thing that uh, perhaps is of high interest in here, uh, and this is unique and permanent IDs. Um, so at this time, we, we issue our own GUIDs, global unique IDs, uh, for everything in the open science framework. And it comes under this type of format down here at the bottom. So there's, there are five digits or five characters that are, are uh, added onto the domain. And they can mean a variety of different things because we issue these for everything. So RPCB is that project, Reproducibility Project Cancer Biology. Tim Arrington is the project manager. So this is his profile on the Open Science Framework. And Coding Study, this is a file on that project. So all of those look the same. They're all persistent. Um, they're all unique. Uh, we have mechanisms in place to make sure that these do not disappear and that when these get published in, in articles or, or anywhere, um, that they will be able to be referenced at a later point. Uh, in the future, we probably will go to DOIs as an option, but not as a, an absolute. Uh, we're trying to provide people with choices. So we don't want to say you have to use DOI. You can use GUID, you could use DOI, you can use ARCs, you could use a whole variety of different things. Um, so either way, we pay a lot of attention to this problem because this is a, a critically important problem in, in terms of uh, persistent access and access to research. Um, OK, so a last point on the OSF for right now. Uh, part of our, our broader strategy beyond the specific features that I've talked about, um, which are, are mostly like daily workflow type features, we, what we really want to do is connect this across the entire workflow. So if, if you use a lot of other tools in your workflow, there are inherent problems with that, right? There's lots of switching costs. Uh, I use Dropbox with this group. I use uh, Google Drive with this other group. I store my code on GitHub. That's three different places for a project. It gets really complicated. <coughs> and different people on the team use parts of those, and other people don't. Um, so there are tons of inefficiencies, at the very least, at the team collaborative level. And it gets way worse when it's about sharing an access from somebody else. Um, so what we aim to do here is use a modern web API model and connect to lots of other services in this space. So anything that anybody uses is something we want to connect to. Um, and that, that's a broad statement. I realize that. But, uh, but it's true. That is our, our broad ideal there. Um, so right now, we have these types of connections. And many of these, hopefully, are familiar. Uh, and many of them are storage oriented. That's where we began. Uh, Figshare, Figshare uh, Dropbox, Dataverse, and S3 were our first four. Uh, GitHub for Code was, was also one of those. Uh, and in the past couple of weeks, we added Google Drive, uh, Box, and then these two reference manager options, Zotero and Mendeley. Um, so these are initial sort of illustrations of, of this direction and where we're trying to go. But we want this to, to be across the entire workflow. So, so things like, um, like survey tools, so Qualtrics, SurveyMonkey, um, all of those kind of things, uh, lab notebook systems, research administration systems, publishing systems, all of these things are, are things that we want to connect to. Whatever we can do to try and reduce the daily inefficiencies for individual researchers is what we want to try and do. Um, and we think that that will tremendously help uh, improve access and improve quality, integrity, reproducibility. So that's the, the broad sort of vision and direction here. Um, yeah. So a, a fifth and last uh, point that I, I want to put out. Um, has anybody here heard of Share? Nobody? OK. Uh, I would have expected this one. So, so Share, the Shared Access Research Ecosystem. Um, so this is a, a project that uh, is, is co-sponsored by these three groups, the Association of Research Libraries, AAU, and APLU. Um, and this is in response to federal policy changes around open access to publication and uh, research data. Um, so we are working with these groups as the technology partner and building on the OSF infrastructure um, to provide a system that uh, effectively gathers all research results. And I mean all research results. So everything that is an output of 
research, uh, of scientific research at least as a starting point, um, we want to capture. And we want to capture that because that's critically important information for understanding how everything is connected, uh, how one research influences another, how funding influences research, uh, all of these different elements. So, so at this point, what we're talking about is things like this. Uh, gather and notify, really basic initial points. Um, so on the left, we have a number of different providers. So these different groups uh, have content. They have metadata about things. They might have articles. They might have data sets. They might have uh, all sorts of other types of products from research. Um, and the, the weird squiggly line assortment there, the, the point of that is that they all come in different flavors. They're not all the same, and they all are accessible or not accessible in different ways, um, which is a, an, a fun challenge there. Uh, they come in to share, and then there's a notification process. So the, the ideal here is if you're at American University and you want to know uh, what does American University produce, who does research here, and what research is it that's getting done, um, you could subscribe to this feed and be told from all of these different sources, this is the research that's being produced from American. This is actually a really hard question to answer right now. And there are some services that provide it, but it costs a whole lot. Uh, and that's not really a great thing for openness and access to research. So this is completely free and completely open. Um, so on the, the right side here, the notification portion is lots of different ways for you to be able to access that type of content. Um, and that's just a, an initial listing of, of options. So if, if this is something that interests you, um, this is the place to go to see more about it. This is an, an example a prototype of it. Um, and we just started really building this in the past, I don't know, maybe nine months or so. Um, and as of yesterday, uh, it has 450,000 things in it, which is a lot and not a lot at all at the same time. Uh, I think our, our expectation is over the next couple of years, we're talking in the tens to 100 million range, probably. Um, and this is only from 28 providers. So one of those providers, one of the, either the, the blue or the orange, is Crossref. Right? So everything that Crossref, which is a broker of DOIs for most publishers, everything that's coming across their, their stream is getting consumed in this. We're capturing all that metadata to say this thing was, was is, this thing was created. Um, so this is pretty interesting and exciting and, and has the potential to really open up and, uh, and make access much broader. Um, OK, so those are five highlight points and, and things that we're trying to do to, to connect um, to connect the research workflow to try and provide some more efficiency for people, uh, to provide much broader access to research results generally. Um, if you're interested in any of these things, we have a, a variety of other immediate ways that you could connect. Uh, we provide training. So we, we have a consultant right now. We'll have additional consultants in the future. We go around. We do free consulting and training, um, specifically on running reproducible and open practice workshops. So right now, our, our consultant goes around to universities and runs workshops on how to implement these types of things in practice as a way of trying to change practice uh, and help people improve their, their own uh, research workflow. So if, if that's of interest to you, let me know or, or email us or check it out there. Um, and a second thing is we have an ambassador program. Uh, so this, this is an opportunity for people who are very passionate about the issues that I've talked about. Um, to get involved and to, to help represent these things and talk about these things. Uh, one thing that I, I didn't highlight that I should have uh, is most of our, our activities we initiate but are actually run by the community. So we have researchers in different fields that are involved on committees um, and are, are essentially working these things out in their fields and, and figuring out how best to implement them. Um, so many of the people that you see on here as ambassadors are are deeply involved or are the leads on uh, various projects that I talked about. Uh, so we provide a lot of the support, but they provide the connection into their domain, um, which we can't do in all domains. Um, so this, this is a, a good model. Uh, we have at least one, one librarian on here right now. 
and hopefully more to come. So, so there is opportunity there. Um, so that's, uh, that's the talk for now. Um, I, I would love to have more discussion and answer questions about any of these things or other broad issues. Um, that's our contact information and us on Twitter if you're interested. Uh, I've got stickers and stuff too if, if any of that kind of thing interests you. Uh, they look like, like these stickers. Badges, CUS stickers, yeah. So thank you very much. perception that there aren't enough peer reviewers, right? And then it takes time and they're not paid for it and, all, and they're not yep. acknowledged for that work that they do. And so does any of this acknowledge the peer reviewers? And second of all, is that second stage peer review a more automated peer review that has to do with the open source program? Yeah, that's a really good question. And uh, that's one that comes up in discussion often. Uh, so the, the intention of this is, is not in any way to place more burden on peer review teams. Um, and it's, it's with the idea of acknowledging that there already are a lot of burdens and that it is voluntary and that there are long uh, sort of periods for that process. Everybody's trying to figure out how to make that better, I think. Um, so yeah, so in, in practice, I think most of the time, the heavy peer review process that would normally happen back here at stage two ends up happening up there. And the second part is mostly a checkpoint is to say, what we agreed on in stage one, did that happen? And a less deep review at that point. Or you could use one of those frozen versions as that yeah. checkpoint. So that, that usually does happen, I believe. Um, right, the registration usually is a component of this to support this. <coughs> so. And one more, and on your yeah. responsibility project? Um, the reproducibility, reproducibility yep. project? This one. Is there a timeline on that when you yeah. There will be results from it? Right. So this is being published under, under this model, as I said, under the registered reports model. Um, and actually, if, if you go to this site, you can see the whole timeline. Okay. You can see everything. Um, at this point, what's happening is, uh, so eLife is the publishing partner on this, as I had said. Um, and they committed to doing the registered report model. Um, which means that for 50 studies, there will be two publications per study. There will be the registered report, which happens now, and then there will be the results that happen later. Um, so a number of the registered reports are out. You can find them in eLife right now. And, and there's, there are a bunch of editorials discussing all of this also. Um, so I, you can see the whole stream. All of this is on that, that URL right there for this project. Um, but the overall timeline, this will take several years to, to have the full series of these happen. And then the analysis at the end will be after that, obviously. Um, these are hard things to reproduce. They take a long time, and they cost a lot of money, a whole lot of money. That's actually a, a component that I didn't really, well, it's, it's sort of baked into the feasibility question. Is this feasible? Is this feasible? And can it actually be, can people pay for this? Is it affordable, really? Um, and we, we went in with initial estimates, but I mean, it's guessing. Like, how much does this stuff actually cost to do it twice? And it doesn't make sense as well. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I apologize for this question, but I'm a humanities person. Um, and I guess I have really two questions I'll, I'll ask. First one. Um, when I see this, I'm really excited about it and the potential that it has. Um, but I, I also worry about connecting researchers. Um, we have a challenge in, in getting our students to understand what our databases are and use them instead of using Scholar. But 
with all the benefits that they offer. And I guess what I'm asking, are your competitors out there for the OSF in particular and for SHARE, how is one of these products, how are these products going to stand out and really catch hold in the science right. community? And, and how can we ensure that people are checking you know, And should they be checking Our science library can set the straight for a <laughs> Yeah, uh, so it, that's a good and uh, important question here. Um, so on the, the first part, uh, in terms of competitors, we don't think of ourselves as having competitors because we're free and open, and we want to connect with pretty much everything. Um, there still is the realistic aspect of choice. right? People are unlikely to choose two things that do similar things. Um, so, so we have to figure that out. And I don't know. I, 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 I would still hesitate to say that we have competitors. In terms of the OSF, things that are most similar looking, Figshare would be somewhat similar looking in terms of what it offers and what we offer, except that was one of our first connections because it does certain things well but doesn't do all of the things that we're trying to do. So it's not really a competition in that sense. It's a, it's a collaboration instead. Um, the, the other side of it uh, in terms of consuming I guess from these things, kind of like other databases that are available in the library. Um, we're still early on, and our focus is is on practical daily issues for researchers uh, in terms of managing their daily workflow, um, which should include uh, finding and discovering and consuming content, but less of the focus is on that. Um, so. I think at this point I don't really have a good answer for that. I, I think that we what we want is is a sort of community participation in this. Um, if these things are things that you think are worthwhile and helpful, you can help shape where these go and how these address those types of needs. Um, Share is is a great example of that in that it is entirely community driven. We're building the infrastructure, but it's the product of a whole bunch of working groups from different types of stakeholders in the community that are, are determining what the use cases are that are needed to, to meet problems that they have. Um, if, if you look at this one more carefully, you'll see that there's sort of a competitor, uh, or there are, there are a number, I guess. Um, the immediate competitor is a thing called Chorus, Chorus, uh, which, which is the clearinghouse, I, I can't remember the full name, uh, Chorus is the short. There we go. Thank you. Um, so it's the publisher's response to the federal policies, uh, which means that it has a limitation in terms of scope immediately. So we're trying to aim more broadly than that. We're trying to capture all research. Um, but there are probably complements to these things as well. They're going to do certain things really well, being that they're in-house within. They're connected very closely to publisher systems, mostly. And we're probably going to do other things well that they have no interest in doing. Um, so I, I would say that they would play off each other at that point. Uh, there are a lot of other players in this particular space, too. There are for-profits. There's Symplectic, um, which is a digital science product that captures similar type of information, does a whole lot of manual cleaning and curation of it, and then provides that as a service. Um, so this could be something that they might actually use as a source, and then they might provide extra value on top of that. So again, not a competition. It would be, it would be value that they would add on top of it. We'd be, we might be giving away things for free that they would currently be charging for, but it would just change that dynamic. How are you going to get the word out to the broader scientific community? I'm sure you're doing lots of things. For a share? Or for everything? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so partnerships is one thing. Uh, so. So mostly we've been grassroots driven so far, um, but partnering with publishers is a, a very productive path for this uh, because it's a connection point on lots of these things. Publishers have these issues of trying to improve quality and integrity and transparency, um, of wanting to, to be able to have better support for a connection around data sharing, uh, material sharing, all of these types of processes, but don't necessarily have infrastructure to support it. 
So those partnerships are really important. Uh, partnerships with funders who have the same interests, that's also really important. Um, so we, we try and approach on both directions. We work with organizations that have strategic interest in investment, and we work with individuals who have daily workflow problems and want solutions. Yeah. I was thinking of more of the latter because um, I think, you know, given the demands of being a researcher in an academic community or in a medical setting like a research hospital, are just so tremendous. Yeah. Um, I, I think what you're doing sounds wonderful, but it, it's just so hard to move people <laughs> into this kind of frame. Yeah. So we, we really stress trying to meet people where they are and helping them today and not trying to say all of this stuff is really, really complicated and if you want to use any of it, you have to change all of these other behaviors first. That's not going to be a winning approach. So we don't do that. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Stefan. Um, so I have three specific questions about the open science framework. And it's based on the following. So we have a data visualization and sharing platform here, opendata.american.edu. And it's one of its shortcomings is somebody can either keep the data set private only to themselves, or it's entirely out to the public. So it's either one extreme or the other. And from what you're describing, OSF, it's, it, there's more control over the exposure of a research project. So the three questions that I have are, is it correct that a researcher can invite contributors from any other organization? It's not bound to their home organization at all? Yes. yes. Okay, good. <laughs> and then, and then um, can, is it possible to make different parts of a project private or public, or is that private public for the whole project? Yes. We can? Yes. Okay, great. And the last one is, is there is there a built-in, or are you planning on an embargo function where I can say as a researcher, okay, I'm going to upload this file, but I want it to be accessible in six months, but I'm going to be on vacation, then I don't want to have to remember turning it on in six months. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, I believe that one is in the development pipeline right now, but I don't know when it'll be ready. Yeah, we, we recognize that as a major uh, desire for lots of people. It varies a lot by discipline, but yeah, uh, and, and in a lot of different contexts too, you know, whether it's for your own personal research purposes, trying to get a publication out, or actually tied to a publication, or around a grant, all, all of these different constraints that cause that need. Um, so yeah, it, it will probably happen relatively soon.